I'm, um, I'm still not quite sure how I got roped into this. Um, I've done presentations on um, PowerPoint, I guess, the last year or so. Somehow when they had this topic came up, um, come up, Joni Dunlop um, volunteered me, so here I am. Basically what I want to tell you, um, what I am and what I'm not. Um, I guess first I'll tell you where I'm from. I teach during the day at Regis University in their teacher education program. I'm a doctoral student in the School of Ed here at um, CU Denver. And I also teach as an online adjunct in the Information and Learning Technology program at, here at CU Denver. Um, what I'm not is I'm not necessarily an expert on PowerPoint. Um, I actually got interested in PowerPoint, or actually, I guess, got interested in critiquing PowerPoint through teaching teachers how to use um, technology. That's basically what I do at Regis, and what I found during my classes teaching teachers how to use technology, PowerPoint was always that tool that everyone wanted to learn. I would, they wanted to do everything on PowerPoint. Um, and it was during that time that I started just investigating more and more how PowerPoint's being used as an instructional tool, as a teaching learning tool, what are the affordances, why are we using it, um, and other things wrapped up around that. So when I was invited to do this, basically I asked, well, what do you really want me to go over? Because they gave me the title and they gave me the description, which is really similar to the things I talk about. And then they said, oh yeah, the classroom stuff's good, add some online stuff. So with that, I'm going to go through some of my stuff, but I also know each of you come with your own interests. So feel free to be jumpy up, raising your hands, letting me know what questions you have. Okay. The first thing that I like to discover, what are we going to talk about here today? And, and what I hope is that the first thing, when you're done, that you're able to describe some issues around the use of PowerPoint. Because I think sometimes, we, a lot of times, at least in education, we don't really talk about that there are drawbacks with using PowerPoint. The other thing that I hope that you have some strategies, some things on how you can improve the use of PowerPoint, whether it's in the classroom or online. And the other thing is, I, I don't know what all the things you guys came hoping you'd get out of this. You know, one of the things that I'm focusing on um, is the general use of PowerPoint, both in the classroom and online. I'm not getting into a lot on how you would narrate slides and do things such as that. I was told, oh, well, it's, UCD has software that does that, whether it's Breeze, uh, there's all kinds of things. So we'll touch a little on some options near the end, but this is not about just how to narrate with PowerPoint. So if that's what you were hoping for, you're not going to hurt my feelings if you get up and leave. The, where this, I guess, my interest in PowerPoint came, it started with a guy named Ed, and he actually just published his second edition. And it's basically, it's a little 30-page pamphlet. Um, and my belief and my interest really is that I believe that anyone before they ever use PowerPoint should have to read Edward Tufte. Or the alternative is to listen to me summarize it in about two slides. But the point is, is Edward Tufte was a very vocal critic of PowerPoint. Now, it's always interesting whenever someone has such a, a rant, they're so against something, Edward Tufte sells books, real big expensive books, on how to display visual information. So it's not surprising that he doesn't like PowerPoint, he wants you to buy his big nice books. Um, and when I first started doing this, I even went to go buy one just because I wanted to show people. And it's like $90 a book, so I got cheap and didn't do it. But we're going to first talk about, you know, what does Edward Tufte really say about PowerPoint that has gotten people so upset? One of his biggest critiques with PowerPoint is the low resolution. And, and what, what Tufte means by that, and we've all experienced this, is you can only get so much information on a slide. You've all been typing on a slide, and if you type long enough, your font keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and then all of a sudden you've realized it's very a poor tool if all you're using is text to display the information that you want. The second, second thing that he said, and it's related to the low resolution, is because it is, has such a poor low resolution, PowerPoints are all based in bullets, little bulleted outlines. Well, he thinks bulleted outlines dilute thought. So one of his rants is that we're actually doing kids a disservice when we're having kids do PowerPoint in our schools because we're teaching them how to think and how to write in incomplete sentences and bullets and little sales, say, um, sales pitches. Now with that, I, I do want to emphasize one thing though. Is I, I don't think he's against the synthesis, synthesizing material. He's not against that. It's just he's, it's more the, the little sales pitches. And if you actually, if you start looking through your book, 
as some of the PowerPoint slides, you even see it. That without, the t without hearing the presentation, so many of these little bulleted things, they, they don't mean anything. They really don't kind of capture the essence of what the speaker is talking about. His third main issue was that, uh, that PowerPoint is deeply linear. It's hierarchical, it's linear. It's very hard not to be. And so he felt that, and we've all been in um, presentations where, you know, the, someone asks a question, they're, oh, well, I'm going to get to that a little later. And, and it almost throws everything off. Or they try to fumble through their slides trying to get to it. Okay? One of the things, though, that, you know, specifically with the linear nature, is, is PowerPoint doesn't have to be that way. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The other thing that it does, he claims, is it fragments narrative and that. Now, Edward Tufty, he's in the statistics, he's into you know, big information-rich tables and other things. So he's definitely, that's one of his beliefs. But the other is that by putting little bits of information on every slide, it becomes hard to follow the train of thought sometimes, especially we've all seen the presentations where it's 30 slides that are going through every minute and it's hard to even keep up with what's going on. And so one of his things is that it, it really takes away from really what the topic should be about. And if you ever watch even you know, the eyes of people in a presentation, it's hard to even pay attention to me because you're just so interested in what's on the screen. Well, a lot of times that's just bits and pieces of junk is kind of tough to point. Another thing that he talks about, PowerPoint, it's a preoccupation with format, not content. We get so interested in making the PowerPoint look pretty that we don't focus enough on what is the content. So for Tufty, the answer is more content. Now specifically in education, I, I think we know that just putting content on the screen isn't necessarily always the answer. Because we've all seen the flip side where there's so much on the screen that you're sitting there reading the paragraph and you're still not sure really what you're trying to take away from. The last thing is decoration and fluff. Okay? This is a perfect example of the decoration and fluff. Okay, when they sent me this slide, I, I asked them, I'm like, do I have to use this template? It's horrible. It's everything that I tell you not to waste your time doing. Because especially if the lights are off, you're drawn to these horrible lights, okay? And then you have this horrible little brand thing here taking up information, okay? So the first thing you see me do is, um, is move away from the slide. So after this, you'll see me, I'm getting away from the decoration and fluff. Now, in defense, as I was introduced to the person who did this template and, and had it um, introduced by the person who didn't like it. Um, the thing that I would say is that sometimes we do decorate things, whether for branding issues, the keynote just had her organization on nearly every slide. So there are reasons why people do it. But there are other reasons, whether it's thematic or aesthetic, that people do that sometimes it misses the point. It adds more distraction than it does helping. Okay, well, so Tufty does his rants, but Tufty, I think, falls short in a few ways. The first thing is, he's focused on presentations, not on learning. And what I mean by that is, I think that there's a difference when we just see a keynote, and your keynote is, I think, your perfect example. A keynote speaker isn't assessing you afterwards to really make sure that you learned anything. It's almost more of a, a presentation, a persuasion, persuasive act. It's not really a learning act. And I think sometimes in a classroom, I think we forget the difference. When we go and I do a conference presentations, and this is kind of a blend, because at the end, I'm not going to assess to really see, did you get what I wanted you to get out of this? In ways, I think, as academics, we'll do these conference presentations just as a mark on our vita. And so it's whether someone really, you know, and if you go to AERA or some of these huge conferences, you'll see it's not about whether the audience really learns anything. It's just about you presenting. Um, and I think that we find that a lot. But... He specifically is interested or focused or ranting about presentations, not on using PowerPoint for instruction. The other thing that Tuffy does is he blames the tool. And this is something a lot of um, people have gone up against Tufty saying, it, you know, PowerPoint can be used differently. Every one of the things that I went through, you can do differently. However, one of the things that I like to point out is PowerPoint isn't just a tool. Um, I believe it's something more cultural, something more deeply ingrained. I think one of the perfect examples is that we have these great little handouts. You know, I mean, there are rules and expectations. Can you imagine, the first time I did this presentation, one of the people asked, well, why are you using PowerPoint to do this? So then the second time I did it at CU Boulder at the TWT conference, first thing I did was, 
I hit B. B is the most powerful button on your screen when you're giving a PowerPoint. Makes the screen go black. You can also, B brings back, W makes it white. Okay, but I think one of the most powerful things is we have to realize we can actually turn the screen off. Okay, so I think that that's the first thing is that um, PowerPoint does not and should not lead everything we do. But in these types of atmospheres, I, I can only imagine what would happen if I, you know, because they sent me this little template and they said, well, we need your PowerPoint slides by, you know, so and so date so we can print them. Okay, I've gone to meetings at Regis where people come in and they've apologized. I'm sorry, guys, I don't have a PowerPoint today. As there's some kind of requirement that you need a PowerPoint to be legitimate. There's also rules that I should be handing out these great little helpful slides with notes. Other things that I should make them available online later. Now, I don't know about you, I, I can't think of many times I've taken these little slides home and really ever done anything with them. Okay? Every now and then there might be a note or two, but for the most part, we don't use this, it's just junk. But we have, it's so culturally ingrained that PowerPoint, I think, is more than a tool. And so while I think Tufty's right, it can be used differently, I think we still have strong expectations and norms about PowerPoint. And I, you know, I touched on this point a little earlier, his overemphasis on content. Um, Tufty almost has, you know, if you take it from a learning, yes? Just back to that, that little trick of B and W. Yes. It really does just turn it black on any, anybody's laptop, anybody's laptop. Miners, I, I've tried it on every PC. I've never tried it on a Mac. Any Mac it's users? So it's function B or just regular B? Just B. You touch it again and it comes back up. Yep. Thank you. Good question. Where's your hand? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. 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 B and, it, and I was like, I'm in the middle of doing this, and I'm like, get out of here! And I just was so thrilled. So I can understand that. Um, and so with that, but one of the things too that I think is useful that people don't realize is that, and you've seen people when they want to fumble through a screen, they're like, oh, that's, um, no, where was that? Um, well, any time during a PowerPoint, you can actually type in the number and enter, and it will jump to the slide. So if I want to go to my second slide, two, enter. I'm there. Okay? And the point being, and this goes back to he blames the tools. You don't have to use PowerPoint hired in a linear way. What I do is I print out my slides, I number them. So if you want me to go to a certain slide, I know I can jump to, okay, implications, six, enter. And it's gonna and that's it's gonna bring me to my slide. Okay, so sure, PowerPoint is just a tool, though I think it's more than just a tool in many ways. I think it's important to recognize that we can use PowerPoint differently. And I think one of the most powerful ways you can use PowerPoint differently is turning it off. However, we're also here to talk about how to use it online. So I'm trying to get through some of the general things and then we'll focus on using online. Because when you're using PowerPoint online, you don't want to necessarily turn it off. However, there are, you could want them to do performative things and go out and do things and come back. And if there are other questions, definitely jump up. The other thing that Tufty, my problem with Tufty, is he doesn't really offer suggestions or, or strategies to improve it. Tufty's answer seems to be, just get rid of PowerPoint, buy my book. I mean, that, that's really what I take from it. You know, and, and for the rest of us, because I think it is culturally ingrained, if I showed up at a conference and didn't use PowerPoint, the assumption would be, well, he must not know how to use PowerPoint. I mean, people aren't, people, I don't think we, someone would actually sit there and think, wow, there might be a good reason why he's not using PowerPoint. I think this assumption is, well, that person just doesn't know how to do it. I've been at conferences where there are roundtables. It's just me and two other people. The whole point of roundtable, in my idea, is to interact. Well, the person's sitting there firing away at a PowerPoint on the screen. You know, so I mean, I, I think there are a lot of, um, it is here and it is a part of our life. So I think it's ways that we really need to think about how can we improve the use of it. What are some other problems with Tufty? Anything else that you guys thought of when I was going off? One of the things that always comes up with students, at least teacher preparation students, is I'm a visual learner and it helps me visually. Well, the problem is with that and is that while PowerPoint is a visual tool and it can be used to help visual learners, most of the time the way I see PowerPoint used is just a lot of text that's not going to necessarily help visual learners. 
Um, it's more of a read and write type learner, but even then, visual learners often benefit from doing things themselves visually, not just staring at a screen on the wall. Now with that, PowerPoint is a visual tool, and, it can, and that's more my point throughout this whole thing, is we have to think and question how we're using it to maximize its visual capabilities. Now, while Tuffy doesn't necessarily give any um, strategies to really improve the use of PowerPoint, I think if you just took the opposite of so many of his rants, I think you could, there are some implicit recommendations in Tufty's work. The first is, use more visuals or give handouts. Okay? So rather than these annoying PowerPoint slides that have so much stuff, if it's something really important, give a handout. I could think of um, the keynote, and I really hope she's not in here and, gonna, and I really probably shouldn't do this, but her one image of the web, I thought looked so cool. But I really wanted, I didn't want this little one, I wanted a handout. I wanted a full size where I can see it. And it's so often that in a PowerPoint, the key main points, and often as faculty, we have that already in our own notes. We'll give those as a handout, because often that's going to be more meaningful for the students to take away. And the visuals I just went off on. The other thing is to use clear headings, numbered lists, or very few bulleted outlines. My general rule of thumb is have bold heading and one, bolt, one layer of bullets. Because when you start going nested bullet, 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 it's hard to keep the connection to it all. And we've seen it, where the bullet starts as uh, you know, solid, then it's circle, and, and, and it gets to the point where the meaning is almost lost. Okay? From these multiple layers, it's not, I think, always explicitly clear what that means. Design and leverage PowerPoints nonlinear and non-hierarchical. Capabilities. I gave an example of just hitting the number slide and jumping to it. I watched um, a gentleman do a presentation on, and it was, it was only learning, William Horton, and he basically, what he did was had a home page where he would have the audience, and almost like a clicker type, decide, you know, pick the topic. You would pick the topic, he would jump to the slide, and it, his slides actually showed you where you could find it in the book. And so he had a way from audience participation to go with in any direction you wanted. And so it all goes back on how you're thinking through the use of PowerPoint. One of the things, though, and one of the reasons why I think faculty like to use PowerPoint is it helps organize ourselves. It helps structure our lesson. However, um, Norvig and Tufty and some of the others say, well, that's fine and good, but don't then make us all sit through the boring structure. You, know? you can do this and then venture away from it. The other thing is use plain, non-distracting backgrounds. Okay? It's the first thing I got rid of, that horrible background. I tend to do something basic like this. You could just do plain white. I tend to do something up top to visually make it clear what the title is. But that's just the way I like to visually separate it. But you don't need almost, one of the toughest things is almost every one of the template wizards in PowerPoint is distracting. Almost every one of them are hard to read or horrible. So just use something plain. Okay? Use information rich and relevant images. This goes back to the point earlier that you know, Tufty really talks about using PowerPoint for presentations, not really for learning. But I think that there are a number of, as I see, four main ways that we use PowerPoint. One is for presentation, and, and I, I hope at some point when we do presentations that it's not as cynical as I made it out to be, that there is that we do hope the audience walks away with something. But I don't think it's the same as when we're teaching in class, when we're really hoping people are learning something. Another is computer-based learning. Now, it's, what falls in there is online learning. But also, and this is, you know, and for K-12 teachers, they can create centers, you know, with little computer, you know, there are a lot of different ways that you can use PowerPoint as computer-based learning. And the other thing is as student products. And so, really, the two areas that I'm focusing on are the number two and the number three. Student products, that brings in a whole other host of issues that I'm not going to get into. Presentations, I think that's more tough days world. Any questions? Just one. I mean, yes. This is going to sound silly, but I, especially when the difference between bullet and numbering, especially when you're when you're not dropping down into subcategories, I'm not sure if I really get the distinction. One of the things for Tufty, and while he doesn't clearly say it, is when you have a numbered list, it's clear the relation of one to two. Mm -hmm. Whereas bulleted, it's not always clear when you start having nested bullets the relation for your audience between them. Now, if you just have one bullet and some sub. So, 
it's not as confusing, but you can imagine just an outline, how confusing an outline can get when it goes, you know, deep, deep, deeper. Whereas, use bold headings, one bullet, or numbered list, and it clearly, the organization hopefully is a little clearer. Now, I think with anything, and this is kind of always my hesitation with doing this kind of presentation, is I think it's more, and these aren't even rules, but I think it's the old adage, you got to know the rules before you can break them. It's not that I think that you can ever use multiple layer bullets and not do it successfully, but I think a lot of times, at least the way I see it used, it's done poorly and it adds more confusion than it helps. Okay. The two things that I think really, and what I focus on is, the first is sound and structural design. And what I mean by that is, why are you using PowerPoint? What is it you want students to know and be able to do? And how does PowerPoint assist and help you with that? If it doesn't, then you shouldn't be using it. And that's one of the first things, because I think some of these people use PowerPoint just to use it. Whether it's to make their life easier. To me, it goes back to learning. How is it helping students learn? And if it's not, you need to get rid of it. So that's my number one thing. The second thing is focusing on visual literacy and message design. PowerPoint is a visual tool, so we have to think about how we're using it visually and what are ways that we can improve the visual use of it. And the first area that I'm going to focus on is this concept of CARP. That's a real dummy down design idea that stands for contrast, alignment, repetition, and proximity. Okay, CARP, and what's hilarious about this, um, if you actually look at the slides printed, they printed it out where this is all black and you can't read it, and this is perfectly black and perfectly legible. So I, that was something after the fact as I'm flipping through this that I got a kick out of. Um, so it goes back to better planning, but. The thing is, whenever you're creating anything visually with PowerPoint, either on a screen to be seen from a distance or on a computer screen close up with an online course, you really have to think about your contrast. And, and I think it's sometimes obvious that we might not want to use a yellow font on a white background, but what I see a lot of times is a blue background with a black font or something that, you know, maybe it's not as clear, but then you find yourself on a different LCD projector or a different computer monitor, and it, it becomes much harder. So I think that we need to really sit there and think about our contrast. How are we using contrast? Yes, sir. That's a quick question. Uh, I've been told that, especially for distance uh, transmission of slides, that white on black is more effective than black on white, but it, 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 it uh, doesn't degrade as much after uh, transmission. I think it really depends on the, um, every monitor, something looks different, so I, I don't know how someone could really, typically they say the rule is, at least with classroom, black with white is the, gives you the most contrast, but you can see that I chose not to do that, because the meat hits you almost, the black hits you a little too hard. Um, but I think the general rule that I've always been told and what I've read about is either go with a black font on a white background or a black background with a white font. But as far as whether one degradates more, I don't, I would question how without all the different monitors, how you could really, I mean, I guess black is what, pretty uniform, but. What, what, this is a transmission to sites where they're projecting it. Oh, and they, okay. Uh, apparently uniformly say that white on black is, is most effective. And I have no experience with that, so I, that very well could be true. Um, and I wonder, too, if it just goes back to, because typically in those sites, they're still projecting it on a screen, and, and I think that the, either to go with black and white or the standard ones, because they tend to be more universal on most backgrounds, where when you get into colored slides, they can look totally different on, in different ways. Um, and so one of my best advice, if you ever know you're going to do an especially important presentation, is test out your PowerPoint in that exact place with the exact LCD projector before you do it. Now, I did not do that. Not because this isn't important, um, but it's just, as a general rule of thumb, I mean, you, you never know what you're going to get. Definitely. Uh, our experience has been, um, and this goes back to the days of the slides 50 years ago, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, in a, in a room, especially when the room is going to be relatively dark, and you have a screen, and you, and you have a white background, which you're, you're, you have a lot of light coming out to the eyes, and then if you have uh, uh, fine material on the white, uh, it's very much more difficult to see that fine material when you have that all of that light streaming in you when, than when it's just the reverse. So generally, the black background with the white uh, detail or, or, or 
figure is is preferable in a projection situation we've found for many many years. But I think generally either either standard black and white, white and black are pretty safe. Um, overall, I think that where what happens is PowerPoint allows you to do a lot of color, and I think one of the presentations they would add color to you, what you do. Color is great, but I think that color adds risk. And if you're not confident on the, how much contrast you're going to have, because that's one of the things that, and I'm amazed that a lot more time is spent with this, is that especially with PowerPoint in a presentation, you want people to read it. So you should spend more time making it readable. And that might sound silly, but it, I, I see it all the time. Seth has signed in. I'm not sure whose computer I'm using, but Seth, you have a visitor. The second point is alignment. Okay? And studies have shown that a strong alignment, left or right, but typically left, is easier because the brain follows patterns and it follows and it's easier reading left or right to have a strong left alignment. But what's amazing is we're so ingrained, whether it's our flyer for our garage sale or go watch everyone's or just the default of PowerPoint. PowerPoint does by default centers a lot of what you do. Okay? And so what happens with this is your eyes trying to make sense of going back and forth, where strong left alignment is easier to use. That's hard because we're so used to whether it's the title, the sentence, or other things that we always want to center things. But actually strong alignment is easier on the eye. The last two points I do together here, repetition and proximity. Repetition is that concept that to be consistent with whatever you do. Now it becomes hard with PowerPoint because if you have more font on one page versus, or more content on one page than another, PowerPoint by default is going to change your font size. So to be consistent with your font, I actually do what I call kind of a design checklist where I write down what my font is. This is a 30 and this is a 40. And so then I know throughout I need to be consistently at a 30. Because when it starts going back and forth, once again, the mind and studies have shown that repetition is easier for the learner. Okay? The other thing is proximity, you know, this notion of chunking material, right? The idea here is that through the bold contrast, you obviously know right away where the heading is. You know that this stuff goes together, this stuff as well. But what you find a lot is people, they like to equally space, whether it's double space throughout, where it's not always clear the relation of the heading to the actual item. And so one of the tricks that I try to tell students is imagine if you close your eyes open them, and you had two seconds to remember everything on the screen. Well, if I followed Carp really well, you, you would be able to quickly make sense of and try to um, get an idea from the headings alone what the information's about. And when stuff is being flashed on a screen and your brain's going to all these other things, you're kind of listening to me, you're kind of not, when you can make things that stand out and hit people, it's going to be more effective. The last point is, um, and I usually have two, two parts of the font. The first thing is, especially in teacher education, people love to use Comic Sans. I, I don't know what it is that somehow brings out their inner teacher in them or something. But studies have actually shown that a basic Arial or Times Roman is an easier font to read. Okay, But we still find that, and it's, and it's funny because Albany is my favorite font. I mean, everyone, has, you know, it's funny that we get these fonts and we like to use them. And there are times aesthetic reasons why you might have a heading or something in a, in a fancy font. But if your goal is to make it readable, Stick with an aerial time surrounding. You'll hear some people say, well, to home online is easier to read every day because it's, you know, it's a wider space font. Um, but the point is stay away from the real artsy ones. The other thing is that all caps are harder to read. And I don't know if it's because stop signs that we see every day in our life or whatever the case may be. The, the all caps in the center are the two things that people just can't seem to let go of. And even after I give this, and I tell them, studies have shown this is easier for people to read. They still had this thing with using all caps in center of the line. But the reason why all caps is harder to read is your brain recognizes patterns. And that when it doesn't have the ascenders and descenders in font, it takes longer to read. Any questions about that? This last point. Non-linguistic representations. And I use two really bad examples, but to kind of illustrate my point, is there's this notion that a picture's worth a thousand words. Well, that's not always true. A picture's only worth a thousand words if it's relevant and useful to the material. If it's not relevant and useful and related, it can actually detract from learning. It can actually confuse the learners. 
And so when we put these horrible clip art, and I like to try to remind people that clip art is cartoons. And not to say that cartoons can't serve educational purposes, but probably 80% of clip art is useless. And then you find these nice little animated ones that do cute little things that are fun, but is that really helping add to the learning? And so while PowerPoint's a visual tool and we have to think about and ask how we're using it visually, I think we have to think about whether we're using things, as Tufty said, as decoration and fluff, or whether we're really thinking and searching for images that support the learning. Okay? And this is a bad example, but you know, just trying to think through it. And I try to even use a basic example visually showing two different things. So I don't think you have to, you know, it necessarily has to be any more complex than clip art. But I think so often I see things and it's, you know, these basic, in, you know, in teacher education it's always an apple or it's stuff that's just not really, doesn't really have a place for. Okay, so with that, what I tried to do is, in, is come up with some rule, not even rules of thumb, I shouldn't use the word rule, more guidelines, some tips on what I think people should do when they're designing PowerPoint. The first is it should support the learning objectives. And that is, if, and if it doesn't, then get rid of it. Um, it, it and, I mean, it goes back to the powerful black. If it's not helping, get rid of it. And I've seen so many times people give a presentation that PowerPoint doesn't work or the computer goes down, and they're, 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 they're done. Yeah. Um, I think it was the TWT conference at C Boulder two years ago. They had a virus, and the computers were shutting down every, um, every three minutes, basically. And here's a room, you know, a conference full of techies, and they didn't know what to do. They could not just get up and talk and tell about what they wanted to talk about because it was so dictated around their PowerPoint. The second is avoid PowerPoint templates, you know, like the horrible one they sent me. Just use a plain background, you're always safer. Avoid using more than one level of bullets. There are obviously going to be times when it can be done effectively, but as a general rule of thumb, less is better. Less words and less slides. If really putting my content on the, this slide was enough, then I could have just left it in here with a timer and, and you guys could have just had this. Or I could have just given you the slides and that's it. But we do actually have, we believe there is some value in the faculty or the person being there taking part in the presentation. So the idea is PowerPoint should be supporting, not leading. Yes? You know, I've seen PowerPoint presentations, though, that are very distracting if, if they start out, you know, with regular slides, what they're talking about, and then they sit on the too long. I mean, I, well, I think what happens, and it goes back to, you know, we have kind of these, we recognize patterns and expectations in the economy, and so we, I think that if we're expecting a normal repetition going from one, and when someone just sits, and then what happens, too, I think that sometimes is when they sit, that they keep talking in their mind, they're still going through their slides, but then they later have to try to catch up. So actually, when I teach, I use PowerPoint very rarely, and so that's what's, it's really funny that I find myself doing things on this, because I, for myself, I find that, um, PowerPoint should be just used to support what I'm doing visually in other ways. And that just adding text on the screen, that there are other ways that I can get in small groups and other things to get a better impact. But that's just where I come from. Avoid distracting clip art and unrelated images. I, you know, I, I hear, oh, they're fun, they're this and that. Well, the hope is that this is to support learning. And that I, I've never seen a PowerPoint presentation where I sat there and I watched the clip art and I just thought, wow, this is fun, I'm having a great time. It's, it's never happened. Um, and with the distracting clip art, it's the slide transitions. We've seen the barn door open and shut and all these things that go between slides. They really don't add to the learning at all. And so I find that they tend, and I think that's Tufty's point, is they're distracting and they, they focus too much on form and not content. Ah, got ahead of myself. See, those dis distracting slide transitions. Yeah. Use carp to improve design. I think anything you do, whether it's handouts, anything, CARP can guide and should guide everything. CARP is also something, if you look at the web style, um, the Yale, I forget, I can't even get the name right, um, the Yale style guide for the web basically um, also follows these same ideas of CARP. CARP is almost universal as a basic way to design anything instructionally or non-instructionally. Avoid using all caps. Leverage the multimedia. You know, one of the greatest things with PowerPoint, and, and, and I should have spent more time trying to find some good video or other things, but I thought the keynote did an exceptional job of leveraging the multimedia with PowerPoint. 
she brought some things in that was outstanding that you usually don't see. So often it's just a bunch of text, some bad bullets, um, you know, and, and, and I can show you a collection of these that I've done. I should. That's really what I should do is we should just go through some of my old PowerPoints and see everything I did wrong. Um, don't let PowerPoint control your teaching. I'm going to hand out these later, so basically with these rule of thumb with some stuff for online. But the idea of more than anything is, you know, be comfortable to turn it off. Be comfortable to make PowerPoint work for you, and if it doesn't, it doesn't need to be used. All right. So then how, how does everything change when you do it online? Well, one of the things that changes is you're no longer 30 feet away from a slide. You're actually staring right at the computer screen. So whereas tough, you know, others talk about, you know, that in critics of PowerPoint, that when you're doing it in a presentation style format, you don't want to put tons of content. Well, when your learner is actually right there reading it at a computer screen, at a desk, you do want content. You want it to be self-sufficient. It should have everything you want there. Okay? And so if you think of just car, we have contrast, we have alignment, we have repetition and proximity. Okay? So everything's just put there. Now, what are some of the implications of this? Um, I think the biggest one is that your same PowerPoint for your classroom should not be used for online. It needs to be changed. Um, and and, and I've, I was driving here, I was trying to think more about that because as we find ourselves in teaching online, I found it takes more time than I ever, ever could imagine. So here I'm sitting here telling you, you need two sets of PowerPoint. And, and so I was trying to find out, well, what are other ways to get around it? But truth be known, I mean, if you want something, so to read a PowerPoint online, it really should serve more as a web page. All the content should be within that. Try to think of other ways that you can do it. Um, when you're in PowerPoint, PowerPoint can be pretty much, you can design web pages, you can do all kinds of things in PowerPoint. And through PowerPoint, you can actually sit here and have little buttons where um, they're just advancing to make slides. And so it's something that you can, um, you could have, you could build quizzes in it, you can do all kinds of things. So when you're building PowerPoint slides online, you need to be thinking differently. Because your learner is actually there with a mouse, able to interact. And so it should not be just the plain slide that you would do in the classroom. Because in the classroom, the hope is that the PowerPoint is only part of it. That your lecture, or whatever you're doing, is the other part. Well, when you're doing it online, there is no other part. Now this is assuming that you're not narrating your slides. I'm going to give a couple resources at the end about what are some options that you can do narration online. So there are ways that you can do that. But what are some questions about this? Yes, sir. Um, going back to a lot of my PowerPoints, because I teach political science, I'll stop. I'll, I'll interact with them on issues. Mm -hmm. The equivalent of that online, so like from your own presentation when you said, okay, what are our critiques of Tufty? How much is too much to ask them to do? I mean, to stop every so often and go and journal, or I mean, when do I overburden them? I don't know if there are any firm rules on that. I would, I would think more if you can modulize it more, where module one does something, then there's a break and they go do things. So for instance, when we teach teacher educators online, they're constantly going out in the field and have to be doing things. And so it is the, this idea that everything isn't right here. But, um, and so, you know, there are different things on cognitive load and theories on the, how people learn and, and attention of up to 10 minutes or so, you know, I've heard. And so I would probably say if you could chunk stuff in 10, 20 minutes, that would be a good way to kind of modulize. Yes? So then how did you, you said you go ahead and put the, the forward, the next, the home, the back key on there? Yes. How did you do that? that Basically, um, let's see if I can. In PowerPoint, you can actually make anything a link. And so you can, I just typed in there whatever I wanted. I could put an image. So it could be an image of a house, could be the home. Right. And if you actually highlight it, right. highlight and ah, moving stuff around, and right click, you can actually hyperlink. That's one way. You can also use action settings. Mm -hmm. But so action settings, for instance, I can hyperlink to the next slide. And then by doing it this way, all I did was basically I made this hyperlink to previous, go to home, hyperlink to next. I copy and pasted it and put it on every one. Okay? And so it's a different way of thinking about, now I have no idea how I'm doing with time. Um, we're just about done. Um, 
right, let's jump through a few last things and then we'll get back to it. But moving beyond text, I think is the main thing when you sit there think using PowerPoint online. The first thing is interactivity. Thinking about what are ways that you can get students to interact with the screen, with the content in other ways. So whether it's through going to other websites, whether it's using video, whether it's um, quizzes, I think there are all different kinds of ways. One of the tools out there called uh, Microsoft Producer, you can download for PowerPoint, and, and I have it on, I think, the last slide. Basically, what Producer is, is a free download that you can record and narrate your PowerPoint. You can put in video as well. And so it's a way that then you can export it as a movie. And so it's a way that you can sit there and, and really, so if you want to think about rather than redoing all your slides for online, well, you could just add narration to it. And that is one way. Um, it's real similar to some of the other tools that I think School of Ed's used, Integrity, not School of Ed, uh, UCD. Integrity is one that does basically sim similar things to producer, but for myself, especially being an adjunct, I don't want to have to come in here and do it. I want to do it at home. So producer is a way with a webcam, or you don't even have to use video. You can just put in one still image and a $5 mic. So that's a way that you can really add some other things to it. These are another two other options. I think these get expensive in the hundreds of dollars. Um, but Articulate Presenter is something that's used a lot by companies now for e-learning. And it's basically you pop in your PowerPoint, you record narration, and it gives video with it. Empatica is another tool. The other thing is games. If you Google PowerPoint and games, you can find from, Power, from Jeopardy to Who Wants to Be a Millionaire to all kinds of different things that you can create PowerPoint games. And a lot of times you can just use what's out there so you don't have to reinvent something. And, and it's a way that online you can get students to quiz themselves. It can be self-assessment tools, but it's just thinking about PowerPoint differently. And the last thing is digital stories. Um, it's my own little thing that I'm into, but when I teach online, one of the first things I do is I introduce myself to students. And I, and I find that teacher presence is always a problem online. Well, digital story is a way that I can actually connect with students in a different way than I could just through text on a screen. And in a different way than with a little video of my talking head. I have a resources page. A couple things I, I think you need to think about, and let me pass these out real quick. Take one and pass them back. PowerPoint viewer. Be aware that not everyone has PowerPoint, so I think you have to, when you do it online, think about how are you making it accessible to your learners? Because not everyone does have PowerPoint. Well, PowerPoint viewer is a free viewer that students can download and view any PowerPoint, I believe 97 or higher. PowerPoint producer, that's what I just talked about. I give the links to some places to look for PowerPoint games, as well as to check out digital stories. And so this is your second to last slide. The last thing is I have some references because there are some actually research supporting these ideas. This isn't in your slides. So um, if, for any, if for anyone wants to do more research, this is some of the information that I've used to um, base this on as well as write a paper I'm working on. Yes? Are you handing out the resources? No, what I'm handing out, are you going to? I wasn't going to, no. If you, but if you want it, it's online. And the problem is the link's going to be so long. Basically, if you email me, or yeah, let's say if you email me, because um, I will get it to you. Because what I did was, one of the things that you can do is you can actually save PowerPoint as a web page. And so I went through and I saved PowerPoint in different ways as web pages. But the last one on here, uh, it's freaking out, is the resources. But my email. Going back to the front page is on the bottom, ploan.regis.edu. If you want any of these, so basically, the, but the resources are in your handout. It's the references that aren't. Then they cut out the last slide. I'm sorry. They cut out the last slide. Okay. I'm sorry. So if you email me, I'll send you anything you want. Um, as well as if you have other weird questions where you're like, well, how would I do this or that? Or I can send you examples of how each of these things have been used. 
Um, what are any other questions? Yes. So, if you have an option of using PowerPoint or something else to do online education, what's the best decision? I, I think the benefit of PowerPoint is that you can, if you work on the modules and you modulize like the lessons, depending on whether your school switches from Blackboard or like Regis is switching from WebCT to Angel, whatever, or if I'm teaching classroom-based, I can email these things out. I find that they can serve multiple purposes. So I think PowerPoint's, and also PowerPoint's something that everyone has available. Um, I, you know, if you have a, something like eCollege, eCollege is, you know, you could sit there and put your content in eCollege every time. But, you know, then, and they can map over, you know, copy your course every time. And so that's a way. But I find that if you actually use your PowerPoints, you do them right. They're almost like little learning objects for yourself. And so that you can reuse them in different ways. And so I think that um, PowerPoint can be very effective with doing stuff like that online. Um, so, but I mean, you can do presentations in Flash, uh, Adobe, Acrobat. I mean, presentations can be done in almost anything. It's just one of the reasons people are using and trying to find different ways to create e-learning through PowerPoint. Is PowerPoint is something we're all very familiar with. But we're typically familiar with just putting bullets in text. So the question is, how do we go and take that extra step, step further to start using all the different things? Because you can create quizzes where on one slide you have multiple choice and each one of the uh, A, B, and C, and D, you select it, it brings you to a different slide and it says yes or no. So there are a lot of ways you can design quizzes and other things where students can interact and self-assess themselves. I mean, PowerPoint really, it's amazing what it could do. It's just, you know, we tend to be focusing on right now just recreating what we do in the classroom, which a lot of times is not enough. Okay, thank you very much.